Okay, can we start with a prayer? Lord, thank you. We have so much. We forget it and we take it for granted. But please, Lord, help us know that having much means that we should give much. Thank you for this time together, for this opportunity to study 2 Corinthians. Thank you for, for the joy of this fellowship. Thank you for the peace of this country, even as there's there are wars and riots throughout the world and sometimes here. We ask your blessings on the people of Memphis and the families there. Things sometimes get violent and that hurts. Bless us as we study 2 Corinthians and talk about money this morning, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, any questions about, we, we talked a lot about text and textual criticism. We never spent much time on that before, but we did the whole class, so basically. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? That was good. Okay. Yeah. Are there people who just spend their whole life looking at all these texts? Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, and like, I, I remember the heart you were talking about, that that's not in the Greek language. Yeah. That's just amazing yeah. to me. It's, um, it, this happens all the time. You know, we have, um, uh, we try to make things clear. We have this drive to, to understand. And to, if things are not, uh, not clear, we're gonna make it clear one way or the other. So, yeah, it's typical who we are, and, and it's okay. It's okay. Sometimes, though, we can be very, we have to be really careful about that because we can turn our quote, clarifications into law. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to, I mean, that's, that's a trap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we didn't quite finish uh, uh, chapter seven last time. Uh, I want to talk and start with verse six. But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his coming, but by also by the consolation. Uh, this is Second Corinthians six, starting with verse Second Corinthians seven, verse starting with six. Uh, oh, chapter seven, oh, verse six. Yeah, and, and not only by by his coming, but also by the sure. consolation with which he has consoled uh, about you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret, though I did regret it, and I see that I grieved you with that letter, though only briefly. Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to resentment, repentance, and Mary here, uh, that your grief uh, led to repentance. Well, well you felt it. Well, second, second Corinthians second, second. seven, and I'm right now reading verse nine. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, we'll now I seven. rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For so you felt a godly grief so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief brings death. For see what earnest, earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, what eagerness to clear yourselves with indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves guiltless in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who was wronged, but in order that your zeal for us might be made known to you before God. In this we find comfort. 
In addition to our consolation, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his mind has been set at rest by all of you. For if I have been somewhat boastful about you to him, I was not disgraced, but just as everything we said to the you was true, so our boasting to Titus has proved true as well. And his heart goes out to all, all the more to you as he remembers the obedience of all and how you welcomed him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Mm. Okay. Uh, like let me... a pep talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, first of all, this, this passage here about sending, sending this letter Right? Yeah, and we get, we're back to this letter, this letter that he sent that, that we, we know about. This passage here is tough love. That's that, you know, I, I really hated it, sent in this letter, but it was for your own good. And it worked. Now, uh, we talk about tough love a lot. Sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But in this case, he rejoices because it did. Uh, he sent this letter uh, and apparently it was unpleasant. Uh, and uh, he can now rejoice. Now he rejoices uh, because it, it, it changed things. It turned him around. It led to repentance. As so a repentance. It must be really. Yeah. Well, is it First Corinthians he's talking about, or some other one? No, this is this is the letter that he starts talking about early on. That that apparently. Uh, so we have no idea what that letter actually said. We don't, but we might. How interesting. We we don't, but we might. What does that mean? Later comes. No, that, that that comes later. We it's find possible out. that we will find parts of that letter later in Second Corinthians. Ooh, this. The, the mystery grows. Well, well yeah, recall that I recall that I said about what was the recall at the beginning. I said that there really are four letters, at least four letters to the Corinthians. Ah. What we call First Corinthians mentions an earlier letter. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. We call this Second Corinthians, and it mentions a different earlier letter. So, and this earlier, and he starts off this in Burton chapter one, so that he had sent a letter to them that caused them a lot of grief. And it, it really was not, I think he mentions in chapter two, it, it really doesn't work very well. So we got at least four letters to the Corinthians, and, and this may be the fourth. That he's talking about here. Well, this letter here, here. may be oh, the third. The, the okay. previous letter may be the third. Uh, second Corinthians is the first, uh, second, first Corinthians is the second, third Corinthians is the fourth. <laughs> so, and? Ed, yeah. which yeah. passage uh, did you just read? I read from First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians, seven. Seven. Um, okay. Verse nine. Okay. So, uh, and that, uh, and recall that he had sent his sent Titus uh, out to, to them, and you see that uh, that he had uh, gone. He had intended to visit them, and we saw last time he had actually gone to Troas, which is the port on the uh, uh, in Turkey, basically from which he would ordinarily leave to go to the mainland to to, to the continent to Europe. Uh, and he waited there, and he was worried because Titus hadn't come, uh, and he uh, went anyway, crossed over and waited for Titus. And then he, we read in the last chapter that earlier in this chapter, that he really rejoiced because, and here, uh, that we rejoice, uh, uh, still more rejoice the joy of Titus, because his mind has been set at rest for all of you, and he boasted about him, and he was afraid that his boasting would, about Titus would, would be for naught, but it turns out that Titus really did a good job for him with the Corinthian church. Oh. So, you know, this is uh, this is all part of this travail. Uh, Paul sent, he was going to visit them and he decided he wasn't going to visit them because he, because of the troubles that they had there. And he'd sent a letter and it caused a lot of grief. And now he's rejoicing because 
the tough love that this, this letter that he wrote worked. It helped. Yes. What do you think the makeup of the church in Corinth was? But uh, both between Gentiles and Jews? Uh, probably mostly Gentile. We know that some of the some of the people there in the Corinthian church, we know this from First Corinthians and from Acts, um, were um, Jews. Matter of fact, the, uh, the, and the the leader of the Jewish synagogue actually abandoned the synagogue and joined with with, with Paul. So we know that uh, uh, there were uh, there were at least some Jews and some important ones, but most likely. By this, by this time, he was, uh, by the time he wrote these letters, it probably was a lot, were a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Gentiles there. And what had they been following prior to their joining uh, and with? Some of those Gentiles had probably been, uh, been, uh, uh, God fearers. That is to say, they attended the, 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 the they were non Jewish, non circumcised uh, men and women who, who attended the synagogue because of the appeal of Judaism in the ancient world. Uh, and, uh, and they followed Paul, uh, some of them. The other ones were probably just right off the street. We, we read about. Um, people who came in from Rome. Um, we don't know their original background, but they have Greek names. Uh, Aquinas, can't think of who they were. And one other question is, what were, which god or gods were the general population migrating to? Or what, what was sort of the general well, most people at this time worshipped the standard gods, and it wasn't the kind of worship that we we have. Uh, it was paying, uh, you know, uh, paying your dues, offering your sacrifices to That's them as okay. appeasement. And in fact, a significant part of this was uh, was giving offerings to the to the protector gods of the city and the state. Okay. So it was partly a civil duty uh, to worship. We're going to go to sacrifice. Any other questions about this part? Okay. Um, we are going to, I'm going to start now reading, uh, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians uh, 8 and 9, because <coughs> they're, they're a single unit. Um, it's about money, um, and it's really quite powerful. It, it, it's an abrupt shift here in verse 1. All of a sudden, we want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the Church of Macedonia for during Seville. So it seems like a possibly one of these discontinuities that I've been talking about, but I think probably not. Uh, Paul has this way of, come on, is Paul. It, so this isn't too late? Nope, never too late, never Thank too late. You. Paul has this uh, this predilection or frequently. He will he will talk about um, the um, whatever he's talking about and then all of a sudden shift to something entirely different. He does that starting from the beginning from 1 Thessalonians on. So he always seems to have an have an agenda, uh, a, a longer piece that he wants to address that that uh, that's on his mind, perhaps even before he started writing. So now, uh, yeah, um, so let me read this to you now. It's it's long. I'm going to read it to you, uh, First Corinthians uh, eight and nine. Uh, Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians eight and nine, and I'm going to read it to you uh, from the Common <laughs> English Bible. So you can follow along, and, and you may be able to use. Uh, you can kind of compare this. Uh, uh, hang on a second.
Uh, you may be able to compare it with what you're reading there. So starting with 2 Corinthians 8, <laughs> verse 1. Brothers and sisters, we want to let you know about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. While they were being tested by many problems, their extra amount of happiness and their extreme poverty resulted in a surplus of rich generosity. I assure you that they gave what they could afford and even more than they could afford, and they did it voluntarily. They urgently begged us for the privilege of sharing in this service for the saints. They even exceeded our expectations because they gave themselves to the Lord first and to us and consistent with God's will. As a result, we challenged Titus to finish this work of grace with you the way he had started it. Be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you are the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love we inspired in you. I'm not giving an order, but by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to prove, prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for our sakes so that you could become rich through his poverty. I'm giving you my opinion about this. It's to your advantage to do this. Since you not only started to do it last year, but you wanted to do it too. Now finish the job as well so that you finish it with as much enthusiasm as you started, given what you can afford. <clears throat> a gift is appreciated because of what a person can afford, not because of what that person can afford, if it's if it's apparent that it's done well anyway. It wasn't, it isn't that we want others to have financial ease and new financial difficulties, but it's a matter of equality. <laughs> At the present moment, your surplus can fill their deficit so that in the future, their surplus can fill your deficit. In this way, there is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered more didn't have too much and the one who gathered less didn't have too little. But thank God, who put the same commitment that, that I have for you in Titus' heart. Not only has he accepted our challenge, but he's on his way to see you voluntarily, and he's excited. We are sending the brother who is famous in all the churches because of his work for the gospel uh, along with him. In addition to this, he is chosen by the churches to be our traveling companion in this work of grace, which we are taking care of for the sake of the glory of the Lord himself and to show our desire to help. We are trying to avoid being blamed by anyone for the way we take care of this large amount of money. We care about doing the right thing, not only in the Lord's eyes, but also in the eyes of other people. <clears throat> we are sending our brother with them. That's apparently another brother. We have tested his commitment in many ways and many times. And now he's even more committed because he has so much confidence in you. If there is any question about Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. If there is any question about our brothers, they are the church's apostle and an honor to Christ. So show them the proof of your love and the reason we are so proud of you in such a way that the churches can see it. It's unnecessary for me to write, this is 2 Corinthians 9, it's unnecessary for me to write to you about this service for God's people. I know about your willingness to help. I bragged about the Macedonians saying, Greece has already has been ready since last year, and your enthusiasm has motivated most of them. But I'm sending the brothers so that our bragging about you in this case won't be empty words, so that you can be prepared just as I keep telling them you will be. If some Macedonians should come with me and find out that you aren't ready, we, not to mention you, would be embarrassed as far as this project goes. <laughs> this is why I thought it was necessary to encourage the brothers to go to you ahead of, the, ahead of time and arrange in advance the generous gift you have already promised. I want it to be a real gift from you. 
I don't want you to feel like you are being forced to give, to give anything. What I mean is this, the one who sows a small number of seeds will also reap a, a crop, and the one who sows a generous amount of seeds will also reap a generous crop. Anyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God has the power to provide, provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way you will have everything you need always and in everything to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. As it is written, he's scattered everywhere. He gave to the needy his righteousness, uh, and gave to the needy his righteousness remains forever. The one who supplies seed for planting and bread for eating will supply and multiply your seed and will increase your crop, which is righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but it is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. They will give honor to God for your obedience to your confession of Christ's gospel. They will do this because this service provides an evidence of your obedience and because of your generosity in sharing with him and with everyone. They will also pray for you. And they will care deeply for you because of the outstanding grace that God has given you. Thank God for this gift that words can describe. Okay. This is a lot about money. We're going to spend a couple of days on it. Sounds like Melissa I am a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay, let's talk about money for a second. For a second. This, we... When I was at the Naval Academy, I went to St. Anne's Episcopal Church, which is right in, right across, right, right in the center of Annapolis. An old church, very old church. Uh, and uh, I went there for two years. Uh, first two years, I went to Naval Academy Chapel. Uh, but they let start, after two years, they started to let us go in. We had to go to church, but we could go to church in town if we wanted to. So I went to St. Anne's. And uh, I, I love the Episcopal litanies and liturgies. And I was really raised Episcopalian uh, or in the Episcopal tradition. So was I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, that was, it was military tradition. My dad, my parents never went to church really, mm -hmm. but the, but the tradition in the military followed basically the Episcopal worship book. Yeah, my parents were in the military. And so that's, that's the- <laughs> Just uh, thought I'd throw this in. <laughs> that, that it was convenient, and so all they all had this in the, in the prayer book of worship. So, at any rate, I uh, but one of the things I found uh, in the in the Episcopal Church there at St. Anne's is that the sermons were miserable, and I really got tired of hearing them talk about money. Uh, so the second year, I skipped the church and taught Sunday school. <laughs> I taught fourth grade boys. <laughs> you didn't talk about money at all. <laughs> I bring that up because you know I got tired of hearing about money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, I've come to realize not only having been in a place where a church's money paid my salary, but also because uh, of my reading of scripture. Let's talk about how important this money was. Let me read from second uh, from Galatians 2, starting in verse 7. When, and this is talking about uh, the current the uh, the uh, um, uh, the Jerusalem conference in Acts 15. That's where Paul went to talk about uh, uh, circumcision. Okay, major event. When they, that is the leaders of the Jerusalem church, saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John 
who acknowledge, who, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me. They gave Barnabas to me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was which was actually what I was eager to do. So here's the citation in Galatians. Uh, we don't get this in Acts, but we, but the, so this is, is an additional comment about the uh, Jerusalem conference. Let me read from 1 Corinthians 9. Um, am I not beginning with verse 1? Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus the Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am an apostle to others, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have right to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife, as do other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working from a living? Who at any time pays the expenses for doing military service? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not get any of its milk? Do I say this on human authority? Does not the law also say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned, or does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was indeed written for our sake, for whoever plows should plow in hope, and whoever threshes should be fresh in hope of a share of the crop. If we have some spiritual good among you, is it too cheap, uh, too much if we reap your material benefits? If others share this right claim on you, do not we still more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get the food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is sacrificed at the altar. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no other use of these rights, for I'm writing this so that they may be applied in my case. Indeed, I would rather die than that. No one will deprive me of my ground for boasting. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me, me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For I do this of my own will. I have a reward. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not by my, of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that my proclamation may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, we can allow all of the directions I gave to the churches of Galatia. On the first day of each week, each of you is to put aside to save whatever extra you earn, so that collections need not be taken when I come. And when I arrive, I will send any any among you. I say, I will send any whom you approve with letters to take your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable, I shall can go also. They will accompany me. And Romans and Romans fifteen twenty five. This is First Corinthians sixteen. It's at the end of. First Corinthians, it's kind of the you know the goodbyes and farewells and arrangements there. Romans 15 uh, is also toward at the end of Romans, towards the end of Romans. 15, verse 25. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem in a ministry to the saints. For, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to share their resources with the poor among their saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do this, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, 
They ought also to be of service to them in material things. So when I have completed this and have delivered to them what I, what has been collected, I will set out by way set out by way of you to Spain. Okay, money. It, Paul is setting up churches. He's he's planning them. He's, uh, he's why we we have a church really. Now, um, sorry. The um, this is not an easy task, and there are expenses involved. And Paul lays out in that first passage I read from First Corinthians. He lays out this whole thing that people who, who, who proclaim the gospel ought to be supported by the gospel. Uh, and he said, that's written in the law of Moses. You don't muzzle the ox. Uh, and, but he himself does not participate in that. He's a tent maker. And he, he, he says very clearly in other places that he's supporting himself uh, so, uh, so he wants to do that so people can't find fault with him that he's doing it for profit. Uh, so Paul himself is very, very, very careful about this. Second, uh, so there, there's this there's this issue of supporting the gospel. Uh, then he's got the uh, he talks about arrangements. This is. Uh, he talks about this notion uh, of the of having to take care for the poor. And he's specifically talking about the poor in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem church is, quote, the mother church. They don't have any money. Uh, these are these are outcasts from uh, from the, the normal society in Jerusalem. The church is there. Uh, they, they don't have a real good place. They're, they're probably, they don't, so they're poor. Uh, and so um, Paul, the, the church in Jerusalem, when they when they sent Paul on his mission, ratified his mission to the Gentiles, they just don't forget us. You know? we, we have your slim resources. So Paul feels that uh, this calling to, 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 to support the Jerusalem church financially. Uh, and part of that now, it, 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 we can you can read it all through his epistles. I read a little bit of it. He he he. It's an arrangement by which he collects money in Achaia and in Galatia and in and uh, and here in Mesopotamia or in in uh, in uh, uh, not Mesopotamia but in uh, Macedonia. Uh, and he collects money in all these places. And he's got a crew of people. Who are, some of whom are selected by the churches, right, uh, to go to to take this money back to Jerusalem, and it's um, uh, and, and it does it so that he can escape any kind of criticism, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of charge of tapping this, um, and so, so he's he's making arrangements, and indeed he's making even making arrangements. For the routine collection of this money every Sabbath day, every Lord's Day, not Sabbath, the Lord's Day, set a little aside. What you live, well, whatever you don't need, or what you earn more than you need, give it and we'll put it in a coffer and, and put it together and send it to Jerusalem later. So he's, uh, uh, that, that's another consideration. Um, he's, um, so we have this notion that, um, that, that there are reasons for this concern about money. Very good reasons. Support the poor. It's a way of, uh, of supporting the church. And specifically, uh, their, their, their main, well, even today, the main cost of the church is staff, is, is money. So he you tax that from the very beginning. He says, you know, you've got to pay the people who are who are ministering to you. Uh, and uh, so these are the main reasons. Now there's another 
powerful reason that I discovered as I was reading chapters eight and nine, and I'll get to that later, but it's, it's intrinsic to the gospel, intrinsic to it. So uh, I, will, I will get to that later when we, when we arrive at that point. But this notion of money is extraordinarily important uh, and we hate it. <laughs> um, yeah, ministers hate the hate it's not the season. Yeah. I mean it's horrible preaching about this stuff. I have to tell you, it's awful. I mean, uh, it, frankly, uh, there are certain parts of the church here that you really have to pay attention to it. Christmas and Easter and stuff like that. It's hard to preach on them because if, if you're there for a number of years, you got to come up with a different sermon for every Easter and every Christmas. But um, so, but this is this happens every year, and it's hard because we just don't like doing that. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this general issue of money? Well, I think the other thing is, you know, how do you spend it? Obviously, staff. Mm -hmm. But what is the mission of the church? Yeah, and and this is this is a, this is a zinger. I was talking before y'all came in uh, about this building. Right. I mean, here's this predilection of people who who will get together and want a warm place in, at Sunday school and to worship, and so they they start building, right? Uh, and everybody, nobody wants to give. God cheap stuff. <laughs> so, so people want to want to want to build Beautiful. for the glory of God, right? And so you get this gorgeous sanctuary out there. It's filled with all kinds of amenities that are not necessary. You know, we fixed the roof a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I mean, th this is a, a, a sort of a knockoff classic neo or Gothic church, right? Which has the ramparts, the flying ramparts, and all, all those kinds of things. Uh, and, and on the inside, there are these beams along the side. I don't think they support the roof. I think that's decoration. <laughs> uh, but but they started falling down. We had to we had to fix it. We had to we had some, up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe they do support the roof, but I don't think so. Uh, at any rate, we, once you once you do something like this. Uh, it becomes expensive to heat and to maintain. And if you don't heat it, it falls apart. Uh, it, and and uh, an example I was using, and it's not only the church. Uh, when we built the highway system, the interstate highway system in the 1950s, uh, yeah, they, they built in a system to, for taxation of gas to maintain it, but it's fallen behind. Uh, and in Michigan in particular, it's fallen behind. Uh, and so uh, the truth is, is you can build all these nice roads if you don't maintain them uh, with money. Uh, they turn to it gets bad. So this uh, you're talking about this building. The only okay. I think we get the wrong. We have the wrong mindset. We being the church. The church. Okay. Okay. Um, the building's a tool. It's like a hammer or a drill of a, of a carpenter or something like that. This building is a tool for the proclamation of the gospel and the nurture of the people here. And that's all it is, right? Uh, and uh, if we don't use that tool, I mean, we use it for the homeless, right? But we don't use it for Alcoholics Anonymous like many churches yeah, do. Yeah, but we only do that two weeks a year. Well, I understand that. It. What I'm saying is that uh, we maybe have closed in our, on ourselves a little too much, I think, uh, by a couple couple back back when uh, Fairfax was here, we quit hosting uh, AA, we quit hosting community groups to like meet the Boy Scouts or whatever, those kinds of things. Yeah, yes. all yes. that kind of aspects. The Boy Scouts yes. are still here. Right. The Boy I Scouts are still that. here, but they've been years longer than the church. Yeah, that was an example. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. so the church ahead. allowed us to stay. So the Boy Scouts allowed us to stay. So, <laughs> uh, so this, uh, uh, it's a, uh, this building mm. is nothing more than a tool. 
and a good craftsman maintains his tools. Mm. Mm. I think about the cathedrals in Europe, you know, that, that are just so ornate. Oh my goodness. And the number of people that they must have <laughs> oppressed to, to build those things. I mean, where did they get that money for those? It's in all the gold leaf and, you know, it's, it's remarkable. And just think of who's paying for that in the Catholic church. Those are mostly Catholic. Well, some of them are, are Protestant. Well, the mostly what you're talking about are really the, the, the Romanesque and Goth Gothic churches mm -hmm. that, uh, of Europe. And a lot of the, the gold foil came from the New World. Yeah. Okay. Um, but they... Um, yeah, right. If you were married to them, you'd have to take it. Um, but you, but here were, here were rich people were doing it. Rich people were giving money. Here you mean in this? No, there. Okay. Let, let, let's talk about this for a second. How was society supported in, in the ancient world and in Rome? The government didn't provide a lot of services. The services were, were provided by the wealthy. Uh, they, uh, then the government provided roads and armies and protection, stuff like that. But um, things like trash pickup, things like festivals, thing, things like, uh, there were a lot of festivals, uh, that's, uh, and things like uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary human services that are, uh, that are necessary. Those were substantially supported by wealthy patrons, particularly in Roman days. In Roman days, uh, what you had, they would they would set up a city, and there would be a a a, 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 a panel or group of of rich patrons who actually governed the city, but they also maintained the city and they supported the city and they fixed the the inside roads and they took the trash and they held a lot of festivals and stuff like this. That's how it was done. In those ones. So it wasn't the poor who paid that. It was the rich who paid it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it was being raised, it was starting to, when Martin Luther came, right? Uh, his complaint was about money raising. And they were raising money by selling, uh, uh, selling uh, indulgences, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, but this wasn't the, the the poor weren't paying much. If they did, they paid a, a little bit, but the real money was paid by the big people. And and, and when you think of the when you think of the um, Middle Ages, there was there there were those nobles like yes, things, Medici, and, and like that. Right, that had their their domains. Yes. There's another one here, and then another one there. That's some, right. some were bigger, some were smaller, but. They doled out what if they were really yeah. uh, benevolent, then then yeah. they did a good job. If they were terrible, then they did a, a, a bad Consider job. Consider the Sistine Chapel, for instance. Yeah. What they did, they hired Michelangelo to paint it. <laughs> okay. and, they, and that was, I mean, the, the Pope may have done it by that time, the Pope had a lot of money. But the, the, the other folks were hired Michelangelo. He got his name by, by doing the uh, Moses and uh, Pieta and all his sculpture. So, so I don't think I, the term is noblesse oblige. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Noblesse oblige. It's uh, Latin or is it? It's French? that nobility is obliged. Nobility is obliged to do what to give to that's give right. more, right? And that's uh, that 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 this notion of noblesse oblige used to be the standard for the wealthy in this country. Mm -hmm. Until about the 50s. The Rockefellers, the Kennedys, the Carnegies. Mm -hmm. uh, the Carnegies built library, libraries. Libraries, libraries all over the country. Uh, and, and Kennedys did went into government service, et cetera, et cetera. And this notion of noblesse oblige has, has died amongst the nouveau riche. There are some who have it. I think uh, Gates mm -hmm. has it. Uh, there are a few who do that. Some of them really, really class action rich. Yeah. So that's that's the question is about where the money come from. 
uh, came from from wealthy people who had this notion of no bus oblige, mm -hmm. um, and they um, uh, and they paid for most of them. But Paul, it seems to be is speaking to everyone. He's speaking to everyone. Give as you can. Give as you can, even more than you can. Uh, now it turns out that probably the wealthiest church would have been Corinth. Oh, in Corinth. Aha, the great one in Corinth. Oh, that's a, that's a, that was a byway of, of commerce. Does he really go on a long time? He does. He goes on <laughs> oh. two chapters. Of it. He comes back to it time and again, and he really feels obligated yeah. to, 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 to send, to redistribute this money yeah. to, the, to, the, People in to the church in Jerusalem. Oh, interesting. So, uh, this this notion of money that we we find so painful um, is actually <clears throat> extraordinarily powerful, and, and we're going to find out how powerful it is as we go through these two chapters, eight and nine. Any any more questions before we in, in, engage in it? So, um, uh, um, okay. Are you? Should I refer to you as Reverend Doctor or what? Go ahead, you. Yeah, you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I've tried to uh, share some of the wisdom you're talking about today, I realized that one of the conundrums that exists outside of even the church. Mm -hmm. Not saying that no one in the church gets confused by this as well. That um, you can set it up this way: you can say, through a question, "Is money is the root of all evil? Is it in the Bible?" And the point is, is literally yes, it is. But it's what precedes it that truly matters. And what today's stewardship-related comments have been about uh, is connected to the moneyed classes through the implementation of uh, tithing, which is based on gleaning. If you go back, uh, money to support was also in the women who followed Jesus around. Uh, there was a group of women that kind of funded operations. Not everything happened with uh, through the money pouch that, uh, that Judas had. So um, I'm also thinking of the amount of money that was raised to rebuild Notre Dame in mm -hmm. France. Uh, so it's not just then, it's still part of our culture that the wealthy can at times understand that it is a blessing what they have. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and I don't think they were guilted into supporting the cathedrals mm -hmm. as they built. I guess the one last or two last personal notes is our choir went um, to Central Europe in uh, 2000. Um, actually, Anne, were you on that trip? Uh, we sang in a bunch of uh, probably Roman Catholic connected cathedrals. Um, but you see how big a subject it is. And then we go back to the last thing, which is my... Episcopal training was at the National Cathedral in Washington. That's where I was raised. And uh, I went to a, a little church on the grounds and I went to the school on the grounds that was set up to support the choir boys who sang in the cathedral. So um, the importance of this is exactly as Ed is saying it is. The message to me, though, connects back to the original thing about the question, is it in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And then people figure that they know enough Bible when they say, yeah, it's in there. But the fact that they don't know what precedes it is what you get by coming to a class with somebody who knows this anywhere near as much as Ed does. <laughs> so uh, we are blessed here in this church, the level of scholarship that exists. Um, uh, the fact that we keep drawing on brilliant human beings to want to contribute. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, uh, what is it, uh, something of riches, uh, a circuit of 
Uh, I'm, yeah. yeah. Uh, in any event, uh, that's my long answer to say that my parents worked at the Pentagon, and that's yeah. how I know what he's talking about. And the Episcopals church, uh, their sermons are nowhere near at the level of the Reformed churches. Uh, they just aren't. And a couple things. One is that you're, you're right about the sermons, but they're taught differently. The seminaries for the Episcopal Church don't teach homiletics and hermeneutics the way uh, the Reformed churches do. That's, uh, second, I would note that the real, the citation is really the love of money yeah. is the root of all evil. Right. Yeah, he, yeah. Meaning what precedes the quote yeah. is what is left out of most people's understanding. Sure, it's in the Bible somewhere. And certainly it is. And they, uh, and that's that's the issue now, isn't it? Uh, for rich and poor alike. And you reach a point where the love of money means loving your evening meal. So, I mean, if you don't have enough money to eat, then then money becomes a big thing. But let me tell you a truism. I sold ice cream when I was at the University of Michigan. I don't know if I ever told the story at all. Uh, you told us that you had an ice cream. I had. When, 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 uh, after I, uh, uh, well, I came here and graduated school, I lived up in Northwood Five, and I tried to figure out some way to earn some money over the summer. Uh, and uh, I saw these ice cream trucks, so I said, uh, I'll sell. That looked like a good summertime job. So I checked in with the companies, and the companies that did this with bandits. They are really bandits. They lease the trucks and they give you, you know, they, you got to buy their ice cream and they take a huge cut out of everything. Right? And so Virginia, we we had we had saved up some money uh, for me to come here. And we were talking about doing this. I really worried being one of these company folks. And Virginia says, well, why don't we buy an ice cream truck? Uh, <laughs> yes, let's so, take all of our money into this. We, 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 we did. We put a major part of our savings into buying us ice cream trucks. Oh, no. I went down to Toledo, or not to Toledo, but to to uh, to the capital of Ohio, uh, Columbus. Clinton, yeah, yeah. And went down there and bought this brand new ice cream truck and drove up here. And we uh, parked it in the parking lot of Northwood Park. Now, this particular ice cream truck brand had uh, freezer panels and big, real cold panels in there. So you didn't need dry ice. You plugged it in overnight. Well, here I was at Northwood Five, and I pulled this thing into an ice cream truck, and I needed to plug it in. Now, if you've been up in Northwood Five, you see there are all these apartments. Mine was far away from the parking lot. So I went over to my neighbor and knocked on the door, and I said, can I plug my truck into your basement. And so he said, sure. So I, uh, I, I buried this wire and plugged it in, went down into the uh, basement and plugged it in there uh, and plugged, plugged my ice cream truck in there so that I could uh, cool it off every night. Uh, and then <laughs> the, the, the rental company had a, uh, the, the, the rental firm at Northwood Five, they had a provision and contracted. Uh, you could you could have an air conditioner, but you had to pay for it. The electricity. Electricity. You had to pay a certain fee. So I uh, I plugged that sucker in and I went down to the um, to the uh, uh, rental office. Said I want to pay for an air conditioner. <laughs> so I said okay. They signed me up. I paid that additional amount. Well, after three years, I gave it up and I unplugged it and and. Uh, uh, and pull the wire out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but when I went up there and said, I want to pay for the air conditioner, and this is my apartment, but it's not for here. I'm playing my ice cream truck in it. And I said, so you're the one. At any rate, one of my, one of my ex true experiences was in uh, Pontiac Trail. Uh, Pontiac, if you go out Pontiac uh, Road, uh, out of town, they had a large apartment complex that then was called Pontiac Trail. I think it's got a different Pontiac Trail now. Arrowwood. Arrowwood. Arrowood. Yeah, yeah, it's called Arrowwood now. Uh, then it was called Pontiac Trail. 
uh, aerodynamic. And it is a, uh, I think it may be public housing, I'm not sure. Pretty much, yeah, low but, it, but it is certainly not uh, well off. Virginia um, drove, would now and then drive the truck. And one day she discovered it. She discovered Pontiac Trail. She went out there and, and just pulled in and the kids were <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And pretty soon the guy came out from the office and said, you can't come. <laughs> and she said, why not? She said, we don't allow him. And Virginia, brilliant business person that she was, says, what do we need to do to be able to sell here? <laughs> and she said, we have to talk to the board. So we went to the board and made an arrangement. We made a contract with Pontiac Trail for us to be able to go at a particular time during a particular day. We had to pick up all the trash. We had to set the prices so we wouldn't inflate the prices and uh, we would not cheat the kids. Sure. Right? Wow. And they agreed to it. And we paid them a, 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 a gratuity uh, out of our profits. One of the truisms, uh, the, the remarkable things, uh, we saw when we would go to Pontiac Trail, Arrowhead, uh, was we would pull into one of the parking lots and all these kids would come up. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing they would want to do is, let me slide for a dollar. <laughs> to which we had a rule, we don't slide. It's okay, cash and slide. carry. Uh, <laughs> but frequently what would happen is some kid would come out with a dollar. Right? or two dollars and he would spend the whole thing and he'd pay for mm. pay for a wow. bomb pop or a popsicle or this for all kids wow. that was a regular feature of what what we saw up there and that has been printed in my mind and it tells me that this notion of the love of money as the root of evil those person the love part is what's important absolutely and these folks had i mean when they had enough they would spread it out. And so I that think- That was the love of people that, though. That, and that was the love of people, people exceeded the love of money. And so frequently we say, they give this money out to the kids. That didn't happen anywhere else. We went to all kinds of places. To the other neighborhoods. We went to all the neighborhoods. That was the only thing that ever, only place that ever happened. And it happened every time we went. Mm -hmm. Some kid, sometimes kids would come with five pennies and buy buy a buy five um, pieces of candy. I had penny candy. And uh, sometimes they come out with a quarter and buy a bottle of something it was a long time ago. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the things I did is I it's cheaper than the other things because I doubled the price and it was less than what these other folks were just <laughs> so I would buy my own thing. But anyway. That that was a lesson that I never forgot. This, this notion of putting the love for money, uh, the love of money is the new ball. Mm -hmm. That was that was we I learned that in spades mm -hmm. in Pontiac Trail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna start. I, had, I was just want to say we were yeah. had a, I had a, well, she's pointing out that my daughter, she was five at the time, and I would buy popsicles and stuff with them so many times with kids and stuff and uh she did she'd run in to say uh, daddy can i have a popsicle I, and her sister she went for her sister and, and, and she um she'd look at me like we're not done yet daddy there's amy there's oh, my son she would just name them all yeah, so yeah, take them. Yes. <laughs> yes 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 oh there, i mean this is where, where where the group means more than the money mm -hmm. and the friendships and uh Support of the group. That's certainly that part is you know less of a You got a dollar, it obligates you to spend the dollar, and that's that's missing from a lot of capitalism today. Mm. Yes, I have to think money. You know, it's like everything else it's got a real peck in order. Yeah. So that what is a lot of money to some people. It's nothing to others. And like the, uh, you know, I have a history of that sort of thing also with my parents. Paul, Paul, Paul talks about this a little bit in the end of chapters eight and nine. Yeah. I was grateful my new best friend, whose name I don't know, uh, had gone out to get uh, uh, Ted. Ted. 
you'd gone out to get a drink. I presume you went down to the social hour to get it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, because I was feeling guilty that when I brought this out, I didn't have enough water for everybody in the room. <laughs> so I figured, I guess there are alternatives so I can do this bit of selfish thing and I could I could make a reference to Anne who can vow that when you sing, you need to be hydrated. And so when we were singing together, I actually dropped this at one point upst uh, upstairs in the chancel and gathered it back up again. So we have all of these confusing things in our life Mm -hmm. And um, and I wanted to connect it back to the Episcopal Church because um, when I was raised around that level of uh, privilege, mm -hmm. um, after a while, um, you can just not see it anymore. It must be the mm -hmm. way Jesus talked about Sepphoris, um, that um, it just becomes where you are and and. The thing is, is I don't think God is supposed to make you guilt the people in that environment. You're supposed to do what St. Paul says later, to be in the world, but not of the world. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a different environment, um, it is great to be grounded in this because you can take it with you. Right. And, Such a uh, good point. And the thing back again about my valuing the Presbyterian tradition uh, versus the years I spent in the Episcopal Church is, is that uh, there is so much entrenched good scholarship that comes out of all these overeducated mm -hmm. ministers we have. And then Michael came in and threw the lily thing at us. And so you couldn't walk in this room, in this building without running into somebody who was basically more scholarly than you are. Um, I, I love that. Mm -hmm. and, we when do. when, um, when uh, who wrote the last temptation of Christ? Ed? Because has been sickness. When that came out, uh, I think Michael was the preacher, and he preached about it. And at the time, I I remember the distinct thought that Ann Arbor was my last temptation because I could go down and sit in a class, and just it was free. But I will tell you how the devil works. One day I went down there and on the way to one of those classes at the business school, or wherever I was going, a crook came into my life. In fact, a crook that Jenny Moss, who we are going to celebrate this week, helped me to get out of uh, because he was a, supposedly a businessman from China. The point is, is you can get a mindset that you're safe and part of the elegance of understanding the role of temptation is that it's like um, the Old Testament moment where uh, the devil is said to be at the tent flat, uh, meaning that it is that close all the time, mm -hmm. but you're supposed to walk with courage. Mm -hmm. And to me, who grew up blessed with education, this is what gives me courage. And can I say one last thing on that one word? Um, I spent three years in France when I was young. And so this comes naturally. Courage, mm -hmm. the age of the heart. Mm -hmm. I think that if we can approach life with love, we can navigate this complexity as long as we are sensitive that maybe you all might need water and I'd be willing to go get you some somewhere. <laughs> and uh, for that to be taken in the spirit in which I delivered it. And Thank you. that's it. <laughs> I know I do not get into what you want to do today. But I, I, was, I, I wanted to talk about money in general. Mind. And I didn't expect it to take the whole four hours, but that's fine. But I have one more comment too. So but I work with um ESL students and um my my group who is the most generous has the least um and i've i've been invited into homes by by families who just can't give me enough and uh, because they're so grateful for whatever it is i do for them in, at school you know and and it's just such a lesson every day for me that the um generosity uh, and kindness that comes from this my group of 
people from mm -hmm. a lot of different countries actually and not all of them are needy by any means but the, the, the particular group that is is the most generous mm -hmm. uh, just hands down so I, that's uh, Paul makes many comments similar to Ed's uh, ice cream stuff where he says, you know, <laughs> I am a, you know, a tent maker. I've got to yeah, keep right. working. Right. And uh, so Ed was not apologetic yeah. about having a wife who was very good at handling these things. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm sure that Virginia would admit to her expertise, <laughs> as well as maybe your lack of discipline at key moments. <laughs> and I will tell you, in this, but, in, but in this church, um, I want to let, uh, say uh, Keith Horgren's uh, wife, um, uh, what was uh, Kay Horgren, one day pointed out to me that the word discipline and disciple are from the same root. And, I, and this light went off in my head about etymology and history and all this stuff. And then we had Michael come in and start quoting the Oxford Dictionary at moments. And, and I felt as I indicated that this is a little piece of heaven. I I live in Ipsy, but we we visit here in Sepphoris, sometimes called Ann Arbor. And it's, uh, <laughs> but this is more or less how I grew up was in this type of environment. Mm -hmm. But my wife was quite happy that our children went through public school. And I became a father, uh, 35 years ago, two days ago, mm -hmm. and our son um, went to Yale out of Ipsy, and he was the first one in 30 years, and and the, what goes around comes around. You can throw in karma if you want to. The point is, is knowledge is replete with an opportunity to uh, feel a part of humanity or to feel separate from humanity, mm -hmm. and the basis on which Ed's discipline operates here. I know enough of the military in my background that discipline sometimes means punishment, but uh, that's not what I feel when I'm near Ed. Yeah. Okay, folks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We'll, start, we'll start with uh, chapter eight, verse one, uh, and we'll probably spend maybe three or four Sundays on this. Well, we'll between eight and nine. And then when we get into chapter 10, it's a whole new world. So thank you. Thank you.